Good evening. On behalf of the staff at the Friedrich von Jens Library of Forgotten Worlds in Dusseldorf, welcome, and thank you for listening to tonight's broadcast. My name is Lechtefin J.D. John, Master Curator at the von Jens Library's Corvallis Branch. It is good to have you with us tonight. Tonight we will be reading Chapter 8 of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs the 1912 documentary of Mr. Burroughs' uncle, John Carter of Mars. But first, I must explain to our newer listeners why it is that the main Dusseldorf branch of the Fonjunst Library of Forgotten Worlds can only be visited on moonless nights and can only be accessed from the water. On Friday, I recounted how a half-second of the library's existence was sequestered beyond time where it will endure throughout eternity until such time as the High God should choose to delete its existence. Now I must tell you of what befell the library thereafter. Once this was done, there were effectively two Fonjunst libraries in Dusseldorf, one within the stream of time and the other without. This made it quite easy to synchronize the eternal library, the extra-temporal one, that is, the one outside of time, with the temporal one, the one that remained in Dusseldorf, growing old with the city. And so it was that the scholars of the strange and of the loathsome knew that they must come to the Fonjunst library only on moonless nights, when we would synchronize the extra-temporal library into the stream of time, what we call sinking in, and at that time they might step inside to do their research. Such scholars quickly learned that to come to the library in daytime was to see a time-worn, haggard-looking building, dusty and dirty and bereft of all its powerful manuscripts. All its powerful manuscripts but one, that is. More on that anon. But to come to the library after midnight on a moonless night was to visit the library as it existed in 1839 when the Council of Prefects snatched it from the jaws of time. The scholars could then have full access to the library's entire collection of esoteric works and, for those with the proper connections, to the library's stock of Age de Montiado. For many years this arrangement suited the scholars and the community well, but alas came a day when it did not. On that day a small boy came into the library on a moonless night and concealed himself, so that when the moon came out and the library phased back out of time, it carried the boy with it. He soon realized that something was amiss, and when he looked out a window and saw the void of space where the overgrown laurel trees had stood, he commenced a screaming that brought four of the thirteen prefects on the run. When they learned what had happened, the prefects knew what must be done. The next moonless night would not happen for a week or more. There was nothing for it but to attempt a highly dangerous moonlight sink-in as soon as possible, so that the boy would be released back into the stream of time with nothing more than a crazy and unbelievable story. But the sink-in was difficult, made so by the moonlight, and in accomplishing it the prefects broke two of the leaded glass windows and crumbled part of the great stone tower of the temporal library. The result of this and of the boy's storytelling, which was circulated all about town, was that the library started to acquire an evil reputation around Dusseldorf. We could perhaps have survived that, but another thing happened to force our hand. I will speak of that other thing in tomorrow evening's broadcast. For now, it is time to continue with our reading of Edgar Rice Burroughs' documentation of his uncle's extraordinary experiences on the surface of the planet Mars. Let us begin. Chapter 8 A Fair Captive from the Sky The day after the incubator ceremony we set forth toward home but scarcely had the head of the procession debouched onto the open ground before the city than orders were given for an immediate and hasty return. As though trained for years in this particular evolution, the green Martians melted like mist into the spacious doorways of nearby buildings until in less than three minutes the entire cavalcade of chariots, mastodons, and mounted warriors was nowhere to be seen. Sola and I had entered a building upon the front of the city, 
in fact, the same one in which I had had my encounter with the apes, and wishing to see what had caused the sudden retreat, I mounted to an upper floor and peered from the window out over the valley and hills beyond, and there I saw the cause of their sudden scurrying to cover. A huge craft, long, low, and gray-painted, swung slowly over the crest of the nearest hill. Following it came another and another and another until twenty of them, swinging low above the ground, sailed majestically and slowly toward us. Each carried a strange banner swung from stem to stern above the upper works, and upon the prow of each was painted some odd device that gleamed in the sunlight and showed plainly even at the distance at which we were from the vessels. I could see figures crowding the forward decks and upper works of the aircraft. Whether they had discovered us or were simply looking at the deserted city, I could not say, but in any event they received a rude reception, for suddenly and without warning the green Martian warriors fired a terrific volley from the windows of the buildings facing the little valley across which the great ships were so peacefully advancing. Instantly the scene changed as if by magic. The foremost vessel swung broadside toward us, and bringing her guns into play, returned our fire, and at the same time moving parallel to our front for a short distance, and then turning back with the evident intention of completing a great circle it should bring her up to position once more opposite our firing line. The other vessels followed in her wake, each one opening upon us as she swung into position. Our own fire never diminished, and I doubt if twenty-five percent of our shots went wild. It had never been given me to see such deadly accuracy of aim, and it seemed as though a little figure on one of the crafts dropped at the explosion of each bullet while the banners and upper works dissolved in spurts of flame as the irresistible projectiles of our warriors mowed through them. The fire from the vessels was most ineffectual, owing, as I afterward learned, to the unexpected suddenness of the first volley which caught the ship's crews entirely unprepared and the sighting apparatus of the guns unprotected from the deadly aim of our warriors. It seems that each green warrior has certain objective points for his fire under relatively identical circumstances of warfare. For example, a proportion of them, always the best marksmen, direct their fire entirely upon the wireless finding and sighting apparatus of the big guns of an attacking naval force. Another detail attends to the smaller guns in the same way. Others pick off the gunners, still others the officers, while certain other quotas concentrate their attention upon the other members of the crew and upon the upper works and upon the steering gear and propellers. Twenty minutes after the first volley, the great fleet swung trailing off in the direction from which it had first appeared. Several of the craft were limping perceptibly and seemed but barely under the control of their depleted crews. Their fire had ceased entirely and all their energies seemed focused upon escape. Our warriors then rushed up to the roofs of the buildings which we occupied and followed the retreating armada with a continuous fusillade of deadly fire. One by one, however, the ships managed to dip below the crests of the outlying hills until only one barely moving craft was in sight. This had received the brunt of our fire and seemed to be entirely unmanned as not a moving figure was visible upon her decks. Slowly she swung from her course, circling back toward us in an erratic and pitiful manner. Instantly the warriors ceased firing, for it was quite apparent that the vessel was entirely helpless, and far from being in a position to inflict harm upon us, she could not even control herself sufficiently to escape. As she neared the city, the warriors rushed out upon the plain to meet her, but it was evident that she was still too high for them to hope to reach her decks. From my vantage point in the window I could see the bodies of her crew strewn around, although I could not make out what manner of creatures they might be. Not a sign of life was manifest upon her as she drifted slowly with the light breeze in a southeasterly direction. She was drifting some fifty feet above the ground, followed by all but some hundred of the warriors who had been ordered back to the roofs to cover the possibility of a return of the fleet or of reinforcements. It soon became evident that she would strike the face of the buildings about a mile south of our position, and as I watched the progress of the chase, I saw a number of warriors gallop ahead, dismount, and enter the building she seemed destined to touch. As the craft neared the building and just before she struck, the Martian warriors swarmed upon her from the windows and from their great spears eased the shock of the collision. In a few minutes they had thrown out grappling hooks and the big boat was being hauled to the ground by their fellows below. After making her fast, they swarmed the sides and searched the vessel from stem to stern. 
I could see them examining the dead sailors, evidently for sign of life, and presently a party of them appeared from below dragging a little figure among them. This creature was considerably less than half as tall as the green Martian warriors, and from my balcony I could see that it walked erect upon two legs and surmised that it was some new and strange Martian monstrosity which I had not yet become acquainted with. They removed their prisoner to the ground and then commenced a systematic rifling of the vessel. This operation required several hours, during which time a number of the chariots were requisitioned to transport the loot, which consisted in arms, ammunition, silks, furs, jewelry, strange carved stone vessels, and a quantity of solid foods and liquids, including many casks of water, the first I had seen since my advent upon Mars. After the last load had been removed, the warriors made lines fast to the craft and towed her far out in the valley in a southeasterly direction. A few of them then boarded her and were busily engaged in what appeared from my distant position as the emptying of the contents of various carboys upon the dead bodies of the sailors and over the decks and works of the vessel. This operation concluded, they hastily clambered over her side, sliding down the guy ropes to the ground. The last warrior to leave the deck turned and threw something back upon the vessel, waiting an instant to note the outcome of his act. As a faint spurt of flame rose from the point where the missile struck, he swung over the side and was quickly upon the ground. Scarcely had he alighted than the guy ropes were simultaneously released, and the great warship, lightened by the removal of the loot, soared majestically into the air, her deck and upper works a mass of roaring flames. Slowly she drifted to the southeast, rising higher and higher as the flames ate away her wooden parts and diminished the weight upon her. Ascending to the roof of the building, I watched her for hours until finally she was lost in the dim vistas of the distance. The sight was awe-inspiring in the extreme as one contemplated this mighty floating funeral pyre drifting unguided and unmanned toward the lonely wastes of the Martian heavens, a derelict of death and destruction, typifying the life story of these strange and ferocious creatures into whose unfriendly hands fate had carried it. Much depressed, and to me unaccountably so, I slowly descended to the street. The scene I had witnessed seemed to mark the defeat and annihilation of the forces of a kindred people, rather than the routing by our green warriors of a horde of similar though unfriendly creatures. I could not fathom the seeming hallucination, nor could I free myself from it, but somewhere in the innermost recesses of my soul I felt a strange yearning toward these unknown foemen, and a mighty hope surged through me that the fleet would return and demand a reckoning from the green warriors who had so ruthlessly and wantonly attacked it. Close at my heel, and now in his accustomed place, followed Woola, the hound, and as I emerged upon the street Sola rushed up to me as though I had been the object of some search on her part. The cavalcade was returning to the plaza, the homeward march having been given up for the day, nor, in fact, was it recommenced for more than a week, owing to a fear of a return attack by the aircraft. Lorquas Ptomel was too astute an old warrior to be caught upon the open plains with a caravan of chariots and children, so we remained at the deserted city until the danger seemed past. As Sola and I entered the plaza, a sight met my eyes which filled my whole being with a great surge of mingled hope, fear, exultation, and depression, and yet most dominant was a subtle sense of relief and happiness. For just as we neared the throng of Martians, I caught a glimpse of the prisoner from the battlecraft who was being roughly dragged into a nearby building by a couple of green Martian females. And the sight which met my eyes was that of a slender, girlish figure, similar in every detail to the earthly women of my past life. She did not see me at first, but just as she was disappearing through the portal of the building which was to be her prison, she turned and her eyes met mine. Her face was oval and beautiful in the extreme. Her every feature was finely chiseled and exquisite, her eyes large and lustrous, and her head surmounted by a mass of coal-black waving hair, caught loosely into a strange yet becoming coiffure. Her skin was of a light reddish copper color, against which the crimson glow of her cheeks and the ruby of her perfectly molded lips shone with a strangely enhancing effect. She was as destitute of clothes as the green Martians who accompanied her. Indeed, save for the highly wrought ornaments, she was entirely naked, nor could any apparel have enhanced the beauty of her perfect and symmetrical figure. As her gaze rested on me, her eyes opened wide in astonishment, and she made a little sign with her free hand, a sign which I did not, of course, understand. Just a moment we gazed upon each other, and then a look of hope and renewed courage which had glorified her face as she discovered me faded into one of utter dejection mingled with loathing and contempt. 
I realized I had not answered her signal, and ignorant as I was of Martian custom, I intuitively felt that she had made an appeal for succor and protection which my unfortunate ignorance had prevented me from answering. And then she was dragged out of my sight, into the depths of the deserted edifice. That's all we have time for tonight, listeners. This broadcast is a production of the Friedrich von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds, with branches in Dusseldorf, Strigoikovar, and Corvallis. To learn more about our extratemporal institution of forgotten lore, please turn to our hub page at von-junst.org, or if you prefer to visit in person, simply come to Dusseldorf on a clear moonless night. Rent or purchase a small skiff and silently paddle north on the Rhine until you see the great stone tower rising from its eastern banks. Thank you once again, listeners. Good night, and as always, I wish you transcendental